Okay. Habitat for Humanity is a good one. I'll throw my 20 bucks right. in there, too. Got it. Deal. All right. With the strength test complete, it's time to make the actual bricks. And for that, we're meeting the engineering experts who invented the machine that creates them. So Steve and Ron, Steve Thomas, by the way. Pleased to know you, Steve. Hey, Steve. Good to meet Ron, you. Ron Hubbard. You guys somehow developed a passion to change the game in terms of world housing by creating a cheap machine that could turn mud into building material. Myself, Ron, and the rest of our team recognized that unskilled labor could easily learn and build their own house, school, church. Out of mud. Out of mud. Right on site. Right on site. Right on site. It's the squisher. It's the squisher. <laughs> How does it work? Just as fast as you can put uh, soil in that machine, it'll create blocks. All right, let's About go. six a minute. All right, crank it up. Let's make some stuff. come up with this idea this idea could be a game changer you're saying that all you need is a machine like this a couple of wheelbarrows a screen and a mixer and you could literally build a village for right. no cost for little cost. for little cost yeah anywhere in the world anywhere, anywhere in the world uh, what drove you to come up with this idea this is fascinating simply observation Saul has been a centuries honored building material a large segment of the world already live in soil structures the issue was how can that be done in the 21st century mm -hmm. under demanding conditions? A hydraulic machine, the revolutionary aspect of this is this machine which makes this brick dimensionally accurate to less than 1 64th of an inch. Dimensionally accurate, you mean you can stack it, you can butt it, and it doesn't it's require any mortar in between. No mortar, right. dry stacking, dimensionally accurate for a wall system that you see behind you, right. which is enormously strong. With the bricks made, I want to see how these wall systems are put together. So they're designed so that they just plug together. There's a tongue and a groove, and there's a tongue and a groove. I mean, it's, they're pretty idiot-proof. Pretty well, simple. fairly idiot-proof. Pretty simple. Depends on the idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Though setting the mud bricks is easy, getting the entire wall to be stable requires a little extra engineering effort. So if I were to be really strong and I pushed on this wall, mm -hmm. you can see it right now. Right. Wiggling. Yep. It's wiggling as a unit. As a unit. But it is wiggling. So what keeps it from falling out? Once we pour the columns and the headers across the windows, and then we pour a bond beam continuous all the way around, it locks it all together. So the mud blocks, Aaron, are infill. Yes. And the real structure is comprised of concrete that's reinforced with rebar. Rebar, yeah. bar. Right. So you got a column here, you right. got a column here, you got a column in the corner here. Right. Another column here. Right. Around the doors and windows, we have columns. And on a flat wall, every 12 lineal feet will have a column. And then a bond beam that's going to contain this whole thing like a big ring, right? That is correct. Like yes. a sort of like a hoop on a barrel. Right. So this gives you a big cage. There's a big concrete cage. That's correct. And then these blocks fill the cage in. As they infill. Right. And they give you thermal mass. They give you the thermal mass on the wall. Right. Cool. Right. So let's get ready for the concrete, because that's coming in the morning. Right. We install the rebar cage, which gives the header strength in two ways. What the rebar does is actually help give the concrete header uh, some stability and some structure. And it's tying that column and this column together with the header, making it one solid piece. This horizontal rebar is secured to the vertical rebar already in position. Once that's done, we get ready to set up the external forms that will hold the concrete in place when it's poured. The forms are usually made with plywood or regular two-by lumber, but the building team has gone the extra mile to keep it green. So this is all Forest Stewardship Council yep. certified wood. And you guys are using this, even though it's more expensive, even, forms. Yes. I mean, most guys would just say, give me the cheapest thing, and they'd right. throw it away. 
Right, no, we can't, we can't do that. We go the extra mile. We try to be as environmentally friendly as possible. We'll take it down and clean it up and use it again. You will? As many times as we can. Cool. Awesome. I admire that. I really do. Absolutely. All right, let's finish the inside of this form, and then we're ready for concrete. Now, you can nail right into these blocks, right? Yes, you can. That's unbelievable. I am amazed. If you had said, hey, Steve, we're going to take mud, we're going to mix it with a little cement, some sand, no water, we're going to squish it, it's going to dry, and you're going to be able to build a perfectly sound building out of it, I'd say, <laughs> I don't know what you're drinking, pal, but give me some of it. <laughs> I would have thought the same thing, too, yeah. uh, a couple years ago. It takes a lot to impress me, <laughs> and I'm impressed. Dude. A few more nails, and the forms are firmly secure to the mud brick walls. All right, concrete in the morning. Ready for concrete. Next, every contractor's worst nightmare. There's only one problem, which is that we don't have a truck here. Virginia, where Mike Nichols and Andreas Benz and their building team are making mud their primary building material for a new home. Yesterday, we finished setting the mud bricks for the wall sections and put up forms to hold concrete. Today, we're going to pour the concrete headers and columns that'll stabilize the walls. It's concrete day, and when that truck comes, it's time to rock and roll because you can't stop until the job is done. There's only one problem, which is that we don't have a truck here. Where's your truck, dude? The truck is on the way. Oh, it is? Yes, it is. Uh, well, we're about a half an hour late right now. That's um, not bad. You don't look too worried. Way. It'll be here. The transit truck finally arrives. And as it backs into place, I meet up with one of the subcontractors to work out the logistics. How do you relate to this? We did the concrete construction. OK. The actual foundation and the excavation. For so you're concrete. the concrete guy? Concrete contractor. All right. That's right. OK. So you're not going to dump it into wheelbarrows. That's right. You're going to build a box here, dump it into a box, yep. and then put it into buckets, and then hand carry the buckets into the site itself and dump it into place. That is correct. Aaron needs to check on the progress of the boxes team is building to catch the concrete. But I still want to find out what makes this stuff green. The production of cement worldwide accounts for 5% of the world's production of greenhouse gases. So how can you have green concrete? We try to work with our ready mix suppliers and have them replace some of that cement. OK, now one of the things that everybody talks about is fly ash. And you got something new. You this got slag. What's slag? Instead of from coal, this is from iron. It actually makes little ball bearings that make everything more flowable so yeah. you don't have to add water. Adding water to concrete makes it not as strong. Right. So the less, less water you can add, the better sustainability, the better strength you'll get. Less That's water, stiffer mix. Better concrete. Better concrete. So this is a win-win for everybody. It's win-win for everyone. Cool. Now it's time for the physical labor, getting the concrete from the truck into the forms. Go for it. Here we go. All right. All right, watch out. <laughs> so you're an architect. You'll never be able to carry that. <laughs> Make it heavy. You can carry a half bucket all day. You can carry a full bucket for about 20 minutes. Okay, we had a little water. So this is actually going a little faster than I thought it was. You got a lot of strong backs, right. a lot of buckets, and uh, a lot of weak minds. <laughs> So basically, this is a post and beam building. So this is the post. Yep. It's going to be a concrete post. It's reinforced with rebar like this. That's correct. This is a beam. You got another post here. And then uh, that creates an arch, basically, that creates the strength that you need around the windows. That's correct. And then on top of that, you're going to pour a continuous bond beam around right. the whole building. It's very important to have that uh, continuous bond beam because that just locks everything together. So you've got the thermal properties of mud and the fact that it's really cheap. That's correct. And you've got the strength of concrete. That's right. Cool way to build a building. That's great. The concrete poured into the forms will slowly cure, creating a solid structure. But strength isn't the only advantage of these mud brick walls. Brian, you're part of the architectural team that put together this unorthodox project. That's right. Of mud. 
Yes. And reinforced with concrete. And your claim is that you can heat this building and cool this building without using any fossil fuel. That's right. This is south. Yes. In the winter, the sun tracks low in the sky, so the idea is it shines right into the building, heats it up. Exactly. And you've arranged awnings and overhangs. In the summer, we'll shade the house, keep the solar heat gain down. And by venting the basement from the north side, we're going to be pulling air through the basement. And you've been in a basement in the summer. Mm -hmm. It's nice and cool. We're going to pull it out through the house and then out through the, the high windows on this south side. Does that work? And these are tried and true technologies. All right. Yes. You still need insulation, though. Exactly. Show me that. The bricks store heat during the day and release it at night when temperatures cool down. A layer of foam insulation on the outside will ensure that heat is kept inside the building. So let me see if I understand this, John. Your colleague, Brian, has tried to explain to me that this house will heat itself sort of like the way we used to stay warm in bed before we had central heating. That's right. We wrap the whole building with this foam blanket, and uh, that keeps the heat flow going into the building and not outside of the building. All right. And so it also works in the opposite in the summertime. It keeps the heat from going into the building in the summer. So you've got to skim the mud with a base coat. A base coat, which is actually an adhesive. It's a cement adhesive. So that'll glue the foam to the wall. So you have to be sure to apply the adhesive vertically, right? Yep. Because if you get any water back there, you want it to run down and out of the building. You want big grooves, right? Yep. And you just stick it? The foam will cover all the exterior walls, insulating the mud bricks. The outside surfaces are evened out before adding the final coat of stucco. You've got a really aggressive rasp here with all these teeth in it. So you can actually work pretty fast. All right, next is another base coat. It's the same stuff? Yes, the same. It is. And then on the outside of that, to keep it waterproof, you have a coating of synthetic stucco. Lasts a long time, doesn't need to be painted, looks great. Best of all, you can heat and cool this building passively. Very cool design. Mike and Andreas and their building team of Aaron, John, and Steve wanted to build a home that would use little or no fossil fuel, both in the construction process and in its everyday energy use. And they found the answer with mud. Well, gentlemen, I am impressed with your new home. I'm impressed with all the thought that went into it. And uh, you might have even sold me on mud. Well, thank you very much for all of your help. So will you say you're...